get back to it and let's get started with the presentation. All right. Now, a lot of people ask me, but why short stories? I mean, what are the advantages of working around short stories? Well, think about it. A short story allows you not only to get in contact with the language, but to get in contact with historical aspects, cultural aspects, geographical aspects. Um, depending on the short story that you're using, you can tap into all kinds of uh, different dimensions of the language and dimensions of knowledge. Not only that, but a short story will also allow you to work just about any one of the four skills in any whichever way you want. So, <clears throat> if you want, sorry, I have a short throat. If you want to work vocabulary, if you want to work grammar, I mean, in the basic levels, if you want to work uh, simple activities like dialogues or, or basic expressions or whatnot, you can do so. If you want to work with different tenses, you want to work with reported speech, or if you want to, I mean, maybe work with more advanced students and, and take it to the next level, to the next niche, then you can get into literary aspects. Uh, you can discuss with students the author's craft for creating empathy for the villain. Sort of like, uh, have you ever wondered why when, when you watch a movie where the bad guy is robbing a bank, you end up rooting for the bad guy? I mean, you want him to get away from the police, you want him to win? You ever ask yourself why? In real life, you would be like, oh my God, he's a criminal, get him, right? But sometimes, I mean, we, we read a book or we watch a movie and all of a sudden we're rooting for the bad guy. Well, there's a technique for that in literature. You create empathy, you create um, sort of like a universal, you know, value, whether the robber is doing it because he wants to help his sick mother, for example, okay? Or how do authors, I mean, get you to laugh? You know, how do they create, you know, comic situations within a text? These are things that you can actually tap into. <clears throat> if you're into uh, literature and, and you're into poetry, for example, and many of you have not mentioned that you like poetry, you know, I mean, you can get into figurative speech, uh, simile, you know, I mean, irony, and so on and so on. Okay? So literature brings forth many advantages. Uh, when you build a lesson around a short story, the possibilities are limitless. Okay? But how do I go about this? I mean, how do I start my lesson plan? Because that's what we're here for. How do I create my lesson plan around a short story? Well, it's exactly the same thing that you've been doing with the grammar lessons or the vocabulary lessons or the listening lessons. You always want to start by getting the student engaged, right? Like this little kid right here. You want to get him, you know, I mean, to break down effective filters, to feel relaxed, uh, especially online. Yes. You, you want to get him um, <clears throat> into the mood, so to speak. So always begin with your warm-up. Excuse me. <clears throat> I apologize for that. Let me drink some water. Always begin with your warm-up. And as we discussed in previous webinars, you have a plethora of tools. You have, you know, Kahoot. You can play something totally unrelated to the lesson, like the impossible quiz. You can play, you know, I mean, games such as uh, Family Feud, which are designed, right, to build vocabulary or maybe review vocabulary, an existing vocabulary. Or you can simply go to one of these many web pages, like ESL Games Plus. Uh, I remember maybe one or two webinars ago, I gave you a whole bunch of resources, a whole bunch of games. Now, remember that the warm up doesn't have to have anything to do with the structures that you want to work, but you can connect it, you know, I mean, with um, the gist or, or with the general idea of the story that you want to be working with, right? If this is going to be a short story about, I don't, I don't know, something romantic, you can find a game that, that sort of like, works with that particular type of vocabulary and so on and so after, but you don't really have to. Um, there's a misconception that the warm-up has to be in an opening for the subject matter that you want to work in that particular day, you know, for that particular lesson. It doesn't have to. That, that's something that you need to remember. A lot of students break their heads thinking, oh man, today I want to work the present perfect, so I got to figure out, you know, warm-up, so I can work the simple past, and then, you know, I can review the simple past, and it's not a warm-up anymore, it becomes a review. So students come in and you slap them, you know, with this workshop, with the simple past, and we're going to review the vocabulary and this and that, and within five minutes, like, ugh, academic mode. The purpose of the warm-up 
is to get them, you know, in a good mood, to get them relaxed. So whether you want to play Pictionary or you want to play, again, the Impossible Quiz, or you want to play one of these many, you know, games of life, I mean, uh, War Wars, whatever, just do an activity that is going to get your students to relax, that is going to get your students to, I mean, feel more at ease, that is going to get your students to connect. That expression, that little boy in the screen, that's what you want to get. You know, when the kid's like, oh, goody, goody, okay, 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 I want to start my English class. You'll have your students looking forward to your class, okay? And this applies not only to a lesson plan around a short story, it applies to any lesson plan that you do, okay? And I, I would imagine that many of you have struggled, you know, with this thing of the warm up. Okay, who are, oh, Marianne is back. Cool, Karen, how are you? Good to have you back. Sorry, I have to take a little pause and say hello to everybody. Okay, just checking on you guys. Oh, wait a second, you saw me your face. David, you've been here before, haven't you? Or this is your first time? All right, good to have you. All right, continuing. Now, once that you've done your warm up and then once that you got your students into the group and this and that, what is the next step in a lesson plan? Well, just like we do with other lesson plans, you want to give students the class objective. And the ideal thing when you're doing it online, I mean, you can have a board, like you do it physically, and you just write it on the board and show it to the students. Or you can simply have it on a PowerPoint slide, or you can have it you know, on a Word file. Um, if you're working with children, try to use a, a cool font, like Comic Sans. You know? Put a lot of colors in it, maybe put some illustrations that will get the students into, into the group. If you're working with older students like me, then you know, go straight to the point. But illustrations always work. Illustrations are always cool, but do remember it is fundamental that you do not, and I cannot emphasize this enough, you do not teach anything here. A lot of students think that the introduction is when I jump into the subject matter. No. The introduction is just class objective. That's it. Okay? Okay. By the end of today's class, we are going to learn, or we are going to know how to create a lesson plan around a short story. That's it. Okay? And that's it. Then that's when you get into your presentation. Now, since we're not talking grammar here, we're talking a short story, then you may want to have uh, in your presentation, which always has to be in context. Remember, we always recommend before you jump into subject matter, before you jump into anything, you have to contextualize the students. So let's say that I'm going to read uh, a story about Vikings. Then I will probably maybe use a little, you know, I mean, world globe or a map or one of the many props that I may have available to me within the class and tell the students, okay guys, do you know where Norway is? Can you show me on your maps? Okay, okay, this is Norway. Okay. Norway is located whatever, whatever. People don't live there, you know, I mean, uh, people are blonde, they sort of look like Stephanie. I mean, they're very uh, Viking looking stuff. That's a compliment, by the way. Uh, and then, you know, the reason for this is that because the weather is very cold and whatnot and this and that, and kids especially enjoy listening about these things. Maybe tell them some cool things. Maybe you're working with teenagers and you may want to work, talk to them about, you know, I mean, extreme sports or the way of life or the typical foods. So always contextualize your students. Now, maybe you're, talk, you're going to talk about uh, something historical, uh, the Battle of Gettysburg. Again. Tell them, okay, guys, did you know that, you know, our country was involved in the Civil War many years ago? And then, you know, always use that enthusiasm. Like, if you see the teacher, you know, in the illustration, he's very, I mean, very, very nice, very charismatic. You always want to get your students, you know, like, into it. Or you can get them to contextualize with a video, or you can show them, you know, maybe some sort of um, a visual aids or you can have them have a discussion or you can start, you know, with whatever. But the important thing is that do not jump into the subject matter. And a lot of teachers say, oh, but before I start the story, you know, I like to work the vocabulary and, and previews to the story. No, don't. But I want students to understand the vocabulary before they read the story. So I give them a vocabulary list and then I teach them the vocabulary and then I show them the structures. No, we've spoken about this before, all right? Context first, then structure. 
give students the opportunity to try to infer meaning, to try to figure out things for themselves. Give them a little credit. Yes. If I say that uh, two weeks ago, you know, I went on a trip to a global convention in Peru along with other teachers, and we had a blast. And I ask you, what is my profession? Uh, you're a teacher. How do you know? I never said that I was a teacher. Yes, but you said that you went to the convention with three other teachers. So students can figure out, okay, let me ask you a question and simply not. When you read a text as English speakers that you are, native, non-native, whichever, but you are English speakers. When you read a text, whether it is in your native language or your native language is English, or maybe in other languages that you may speak, do you understand every single word that you read? Right. Nobody does. I speak Spanish, I Italian, I speak English, and, and it doesn't matter what I read, you always want to find vocabulary that sometimes even simple vocabulary. You know, I was reading I was reading the, the Iliad the other day, you know, I mean the story of the world Troy, and said that Ulysses was a very bellicose uh, individual. Bellicose, you know. Well, I guess that means that he's, you know, I mean he's tough. He likes to fight. Then I remember, oh, okay, that comes from war. I didn't know the word, but I figured it out. So a lot of times, you know, you need to give your students the chance to figure out what's going on. So the important thing is that you contextualize them within the context of the story. And then the first thing that you want to do when you present the story to your students is to have them try to figure out the general idea. Don't go from specific to general. You need to go from general to specific. So then as you work the story, and as you read the story with the students, then you may want to ask them questions like, so where is this taking place? Yeah. What is going on? What do you think is happening? Why, why is this guy crying? What happened to him? You know? Why was the little girl so happy? If you're working with little kids, you know, okay, so what did the dog do? Why did the dog do it? And then you go, you know, into specifics. The important thing with short stories, like the name says it, if you're going to read a short story, be coherent with the level and the age level. Uh, you don't want to read For Whom the Bell Tolls by Ernest Hemingway, you know, with 12 year olds. I mean, maybe they're nerds like me. I, I read The Old Man in the Sea when I was 10 and I enjoyed it, but most kids, you know, are, would not enjoy that. Right? And you don't want to read, you know, The, the Three Little Bears or Big Bad Wolf and Little Red Riding Hood with a grown-up. Again, we've spoken about this. And then you want to be careful, you know, with uh, cultural aspects of the language, with Asian people, for example, there are some stories that are just inappropriate. Make sure that you scan the language. Make sure that whatever story you choose is appropriate for the target language that you want to work. Now, remember that short stories can be used for listening comprehension, for example. So if you're gonna use a short story for listening comprehension, then do not use a short story in text. Use a podcast or use a recording. If your focus is going to be uh, the short story for generating you know, speaking skills, then you can use either format. Either way, you're going to need to use all four skills. You're going to have reading involved, you're going to have listening involved, you're going to have speaking involved, and many times you're going to have writing involved, yes? That one is pretty much optional, but the other three are always there. So if you're going to work speaking, then you can do cool activities like, okay, guys, I'm going to ask Maxine to read, you know, I mean, paragraph one, only paragraph one, Maxine. You need to ignore all the other paragraphs, okay? Laura, you're going to read paragraph two. You're going to read paragraph three. Eleni is going to read paragraph four. That is going to read paragraph and actually going to read paragraph six, okay? Read it several times. And that's what I would ask my students, okay? Now, once I've done this, then I would say, okay, guys, I need you to get together and discuss the story. So, Maxine, you only read paragraph one. Now you're going to have to talk to Laura and Stephanie and all the others to figure out what happened, you know, in the rest of the story. And they'll have to talk to you to figure out what happened on, on, on the first paragraph. And Laura will have to talk to you to find out what happened in paragraph one and to step in. So that's a cool way to use a story to generate, you know, communicative skills or communicative approach. 
Okay? A lot of people think that communicative approach is about talking. It's an oral class. No, communicative approach is using the tools at hand to generate listening, to generate reading comprehension, to generate speaking, to generate writing from a context in which communication takes place through interaction. And short stories are awesome for that because you can present the short story like I just showed you. You can present in chunks, okay? You can present it in such a way that students will need to organize, you know, the, the, the correct sequence. You can do a whole bunch of activities. You can even leave out the ending and have students figure out what the ending was or try to predict what the ending was, right? Again, it's all a matter of you basically focusing the lesson towards where you want to go. Whether, I, like I said, whether it's listening. Now, maybe you want to work reading comprehension. So you might want to step away a little bit from the classic, you know, multiple choice and true and false, you know, questions. That can get boring for students. Make it a little bit more challenging. Like, use open-ended questions. We've spoken about this, especially with intermediate and advanced students, okay? Questions where they'll create, where they'll basically produce. I would ask him questions like, okay, so we read this story about, you know, this guy during the roaring 20s. And we see that back then the values, you know, were the big mansion and, and the bling bling was a little bit different from now and whatnot. How would the story go if it happened today? Or maybe I'm reading Beowulf, you know, with an advanced, you know, group of students. And then we see that Beowulf takes pride on his sword, you know, and, and everybody's like, wow, look at that sword. This guy must be, you know, a very prestigious warrior, you know, he's got to have money. And all the girls are like, oh my God, look at that sword. My God, it's so cool, look at that armor. What would be the equivalent of a 20th century? Oh my God, look at that Ferrari. <laughs> look at the Rolex. Okay, he's hot, he's not so ugly. So, I mean, you can make this connection with students, right? And, 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 and there are limitless options of what you can do with literature. So again, recap for the ones that just came in. We started always, you know, with or warm up, just like in any regular class. Again, emphasis on telling you that the warm up does not have to do anything with the lesson itself or anything that you have seen before. Of course, whatever you're going to do in the warm up should be in a language that they already understand, but it doesn't have to be a review or it doesn't have to be directly connected to what you want to teach. Then we go into the introduction. And what do we do into the introduction? By the end of today's webinar, Students will be able to create a lesson plan around a short story. That's it. That's the introduction. No more. <clears throat> then the rule of thumb with the presentation. Context, 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 context. I see a lot of lesson plans. Okay, in the presentation, I'm going to present the language with the formula. Okay. Or I am going to teach them the vocabulary before we read the story. Okay, but no, because I think no, 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 no. Yes, I respect, you know, very, very much what you think, but you got to do it the right way. Okay. There's your way, there's my way, and then there's the right way. We don't do it your way, we don't do it my way. We do it the right way. That's what I always tell my teachers, you know, I mean, it's not about my personal preferences or your personal preferences. That's what we get trained for. That's why we do, I mean, all these TEFL courses and we read, you know, and we learn. And it's such a shame, you know, when teachers spend so much time training themselves and then they say, ah, I'll just do it my way. I always compare it to, um, to a sergeant, you know, in war that has already crossed successfully a minefield. And he's on the other side of the minefield and he's telling the other soldiers, come this way. And one soldier goes, ah, I think I'll go this way. <laughs> you know? Or maybe I'll go this way. <laughs> You know, and after getting hurt, hurt 27 times, maybe I'll listen to the sergeant. <laughs> but that's human nature, right? Yes, students will have problems understanding the text. Students will have problems understanding the subject matter. But that's the idea. You need them to struggle. Uh, a student of mine was telling me the other day, but I'm having trouble with this material. Good. Because if I'm teaching you something and you understand everything, then we got a problem. Think of zone of proximal development. If what I'm teaching you is something that you already handled, that's like me being your trainer in the gym, you know, and I'm showing you exercises, and I'm showing you routines that you already know and do standing on your head, 
then what the hell do you need me for? You need your students to struggle a little, to be, I mean, a little bit confused. And I say that in a good way. They need to make that effort for those processes of metacognition, for those processes of synapses to happen, to, I mean, generate this new knowledge, okay? Now that I did my presentation, and then I jumped, you know, into the story. So again, remember, the presentation is about contextualizing the students within where the story is taking place, or what's going on in the story, or one more moment in history, or basically the general or the gist of what's going on, okay? Then we go into the practice. And then when you go into the practice, you know, I mean, after you see the story, and the story can be something simple like this, it can be something more complex. Today, as always, I'm going to show you some cool resources because I'm pretty sure that you're saying, yes, James, we know this. We know that we have to do a warm-up, an introduction, you know, presentation, whatnot. We want to see where do we get the short stories? Where do we get the activities, right? We'll get to that in a second. Then I can do my post-reading activities. Now, there are basically uh, three main types of activities that I can do when I work with a text. Comprehension of the text. Okay, so where did the story happen? Uh, where did she go? You know, what did he eat? How did he do it? When did they go? Etc. Etc. and so on. What year? How many years? How old was he? How many friends did he have? How many brothers and sisters? What was his father's name? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then you can go to text analysis. If you want to take it to the next inch. Why was she crying? What was the, the internal conflict that drove this main character? Okay. Now, when he was speaking in prose and he said, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art but love, him more separate. Rock winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's leaves have fallen to shorter date. Was Shakespeare high? No. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Meaning you are more beautiful, more radiant than a summer's day. You know? Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. It means that misfortune happens to even the young ones. And summer's leaves have told to shorten date. Sometimes people, you know, basically croak. Sorry, that sounded rough. In the summer of their lives. So it's actually, poetry actually becomes really cool when you work on these dimensions. Then you're simply memorizing and learning the vocabulary. And then you start, you know, you start saying, well, wasn't Shakespeare married? Well, the tr truth is that we don't even know if Shakespeare actually existed. Or if he was just an alter ego like many authors nowadays. But that's fun to basically explore these options, you know, with, with students. Uh, I mentioned Beowulf before. And then, you know, you say, well, if Beowulf was oral tradition, you know, in Norway, and you had Odin, and, and you had Thor, and, and you had all these gods, you know, why in the written text, you know, Beowulf says, well, thanks to the Almighty, and thanks to, you know, the Holy Trinity, and this and that, why does he make that allusion to God? And then you can explore, you know, how Pope Gregory sent St. Augustine, you know, during, you know, medieval times to Europe to try to canonize people, and how they use these oral, you know, story traditions, such as Beowulf, and they transformed it, and then they rewrote it to create sort of like a, a very strong impact. How Beowulf, you know, uh, conquers uh, Grendel's mother with a sword that was forced by giants, and giants, you know, were the offspring of the mixture of celestial beings, angels, and humans, and only through, you know, divine intervention that you can conquer evil. And at the end, the story becomes, you know, an analogy of Christianity, you know, basically kicking, you know, paganism's uh, butt. I don't mean to bore you with this, but students will actually get fascinated with this. If you go beyond, you know, the simple textuality, that's what literature is all about. Literature is beautiful. I'm a literature buff. And as an English teacher, you should get into it. Because then you can start exploring all the different dimensions. In a story like, like um, Short stories by Ernest Hemingway, you can explore, you know, cultural aspects, aspects of fashion, uh, human values. Mark Twain, love his humor. Edgar Allan Poe, how sick was this guy? I mean, uh, what is this, you know, the telltale tale? The guy went crazy because the other guy, you know, his eye kept looking at him and his eye kept looking at him, so 
So he went and basically, you know, dismembered him <laughs> and put him under the boards. Of course, audience appropriate, you know, audience appropriate, you know. And then, you know, you can explore things like uh, when, when you read, you know, the Green Brothers stories, they were not meant for children at first, you know, these things were written as horror stories for adults. So when you go beyond with your students and you say, yeah, but you know, with, with the basic level students, there are many things that you can do with basic level students as well. Maybe you want to tap into their writing so you can create some exercises based on the story. How about we write an alternate ending? How about you leave out parts of the story and you have the students try to figure out how to connect the dots? Maybe you want to work on specific vocabulary. Leave out that vocabulary, have the students try to figure out, you know, what words are supposed to go in there, like those activities, right? Maybe the ending could have been more interesting. We've spoken at that, about that before. Use your imagination. Maybe you can have a discussion instead of creative writing. Maybe you can have a collective writing exercise like we did once in one of these webinars, you know, where we told the story and one person started and then that person stopped and then the next person took on and took on and took on. In writing, you know, based on a story, maybe, I mean, with kids nowadays, I mean, they're so smart. You can talk about with, with all these Marvel Universe thing going on, you know, and then alternate universes and whatnot, you know, Dragon Ball, you can tap into all of that. But what about if this story happened in a parallel universe? What about if, 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 if the guy, instead of falling in love with Maxine, uh, fell in love with Laura? How would his life have changed and what would have happened to Maxine? You know, it's, it's amazing what you can do with literature, okay? You can tap into students' areas of interest. Your students maybe are into sports, then. You can write, you know, I mean, you can work with short stories based on sports characters or sports heroes. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, your students are into music, then find short stories that have to do with artists and whatnot. Always make sure that the stories or the subject matter or the material that you select is going to be engaging and relatable. I, I cannot say this enough to your students' interests or areas of interests, okay? The important thing is that don't use literature as a hammer. And what, what I mean by a hammer? That students will say, oh my God, we have to read this crap. Excuse my French. You know, we have to read this stuff. Tap into students' areas of interest, and then they will read it for they will be reading for enjoyment. And when they read for enjoyment, then all the academic stuff happens magically. All the objectives are reached magically. But when you have to twist, you know, the students are read, no, read. Like when you're trying to feed your baby, you know, by force, you know, he gets food all over him. And believe me, I know. I mean, you have to like. Make them fall in love, you know, with the subject matter. How do you make them fall in love with the subject matter? Well, tap into stuff that they like, you know. I've done uh, literature projects with students, and of course, there's always, there always has to be an essay in some sort of like formal, you know, literary um, production at the end. But then I would ask my students, okay, guys, uh, how many of you guys are into architecture, you know, Minecraft, and maybe building stuff like that? Oh, we are, okay, your final project is going to build a, representation or some sort of model, whether physical or virtual, of the main character's home. And you're going to explain, you know, in your final essay, you're going to tell us why he chose that house, why he built the house in such a way, why he used that furniture, what kind of values was he or she trying to express. Uh, how many of you guys are into fashion? Most of the girls will be like, there'll be two or three go, oh, me, 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 okay. So you guys are going to do a fashion show. You can use dolls, or you can do your own whole, you know, clothing fashion show, showing the fashions of the era that we saw in the story. What values or why did people dress like that? What, what were they trying to express? And contrast it, you know, with the way that you girls dress now and what you're trying to express, what that says about your identity, who you are, what you want to be. And then I would ask other students, okay, how many of you guys are into writing? Oh, we are. I had a student says, I'm into photography, teacher. I love photography. I said, well, how about if you find some photographs of advertisements of the era and you explain to me what that said about that culture and beliefs, you know, and, and, and how people felt and what people wanted and what people wanted to go in the era and contrast it with some advertisements, you know, I mean, done by you with your photography. You would be amazed 
what your students come up with. Okay. And this is when we're talking about you know high school students or students that already speak the language again. Elementary, I mean, or basic students, of course, you want to use it for more basic stuff. But when you start working with advanced students, then your lesson plans become adventures of knowledge. You know, they become so cool. Like I, I told you this anecdote once. So myself, you know, teaching the Iroquois constitution to 10th graders. And then how do you feed the Iroquois constitution to 10th graders? I mean, they don't want to read about the Navajo and the Comanches and this and that. So I wore, you know, this giant, you know, feather pinnacle and I jumped on a tree and I had my students meet me in the back. And when they came, you know, they see, you know, crazy games up there saying, I am the Kanahiwa, leader of the seven nations. And this is the tree of the five nations, the Navajo. How many of you Navajo? Me, jump on the tree, Navajo. Okay, the Iroquois, how many of you Iroquois? And then, you know, I mean, we had a blast. And the literature went from something more. So don't be afraid to tap into the child inside of you, to your craziness, right? Short stories are fantastic because they express everything that we are as human beings. Of course, liter works of literature do so as well, but are not as manageable as short stories. Short stories have all the elements of a plot. They all have, you know, a beginning, they have a rising action, they have a climax, they have a falling action, they have a conclusion. They have an inner conflict, they have an outer conflict. They have all of the elements that basically makes us humans and that's why they're so appealing to every single culture. And that's what you want to tap into, okay? And then, of course, you want to create discussions. Uh, this, is, this is a very cool way to generate, you know, speaking skills where the students will not be so concerned about saying, okay, I decided and I want it, yes, and I read. No, don't focus on accuracy, focus on fluency. They will be so engaged in the story, they will be so much into it that they'll forget about making mistakes or not. And that's what you want from students. You want them to basically start generating, generating that fluency. When they're self-conscious about being correct all the time, or they're anxious because they want to make mistakes, then what's going to happen? Yeah? They're not going to be really into the material, into the subject matter itself, right? So what you want to do is you want to get them you know, really engaged. Even little children. Little children love short stories. Um, there's um, there's this uh, program uh, on Netflix, which is called Masha and the Bear. And my kids love it. And there's like a, a spin-off show of Masha. She's this little girl that lives in the forest, you know, and, and she has this interaction with the bear, pretty much like my son and I. She makes the bear's life miserable, you know, and because she's so mischievous. And the bear loves her, you know, and protects her and this and that. It's, it's very cute. And she also has uh, a spin-off show, which is Masha's Stories. And she tells you know a lot of cool stories. We can take a look at it in a little while, you know, on Netflix. Uh, we have time after I show you everything else. And and these are like really cool, you know, I mean, resources that you have at hand. You know, things like Netflix are, are not only for watching, you know, the last uh, series of Lucifer or, or or the last you know season of Vikings. Well, actually, Vikings is pretty cool, and you can connect it with literature as well. But um, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff that you can find there. You know. With, with little children, sometimes it works best to work with visual age, you know, with visual stories, cartoons and stuff like that, you know, and throw in there the captions or throw in, I mean, there the text. But remember that short stories come not only in writing, they come also in audio and they come also in video, okay? So there are many uh, different formats that you can tap into. One of my favorite activities, and, and this one is like for the, uh, maybe lower level students, I call it broken telephone, or you can even call it running dictation, which is a spin of a broken telephone. In which I'll have students, you know, read a small portion, maybe a sentence or two sentences, you know, and I'll put them in three teams and I'll have the teams, you know, in rows. This is physically. Here, you can do it using the rows, or here you can use it, you know, having the students basically contact each other via WhatsApp, depending on which context you are. But the idea is that one student reads one part and then tells it verbally to the other student, and that student tells it verbally to the other one, and then that student tells it verbally to the other one. And then the last one tries to repeat, you know, what the first one said about the story. And of course, it's going to be totally incoherent and it's never going to sound the same, but that's the fun part about it, all right? 
And can you do it online? Yes, you can do it online. If you have, you know, a group of students that are in the same area, and, and usually you know, students are connected, they have the groups, uh, or classes are connected, they have the group via WhatsApp or via other, you know, social media. Hey, have them grab their telephone and, you know, send, uh, you know, a voice message to one, and that one sends a voice message to the other one, and the other one sends a voice message to the other one, and you have your broken telephone. Use technology, you know, it works for you. It doesn't work against you, all right? Quiz your classmates is one that I love to do, especially when I do the, um, the activity where I have different students read different paragraphs. The example that I give you at the beginning, I have students read different paragraphs. I have five students online right now. So I will not send my students and I will not show them the story online. I will send my students, right? Different parts of the text, different paragraphs, like I said before, and I'll have them read them, you know, individually. And then I'll have them connect with each other, whether in the breakout rooms or maybe even WhatsApp, you know, audios, try to narrate to each other, you know, what happens on the other paragraphs. And then students can quiz the other students on the paragraph that they read. The other ones didn't read them, we narrated it to them. So that will encourage them to be really inquisitive of, okay, tell me more about what you read. Tell me more, okay, well, yeah, but is that it? Is that what happened? Okay, and then you get them engaged. And then uh, creating basically uh, competitive contexts will always work with students of any ages. We all love to play games. We all love to compete, you know. We all love to participate, and we all love to win. Or maybe lose sometimes, but in a fun way, okay? Sometimes you can find related news. Let's say that you're reading a short story that happens during the bubonic plague in Europe. How do you relate it to today? Well, COVID, right? Maybe you're reading, you know, a short story about war for whom the bell tolls said Ernest Hemingway, for example. He has a lot of stories around war. Or Leo Tolstoy has fantastic, you know, I mean, short stories. Um, there are a lot of conflicts going around the world today. Maybe you're reading a story about, um, you know, mystical beliefs. You can always find related news, or related texts, or related articles, yeah, that can make that connection from the text, from the short story, to the student's real life, to the student's real context. Again, the trick here, and, and what I found with literature, um, with any genre of literature, I've right? worked them all, I, as you know, I, I was a college professor and I taught literature for many years. Was to always engage the students while creating that connection between what they read and what the real life is, what the real environment is. And you can prepare surveys. Then you can work into the basics, parts of speech. You know, we're going to work nouns, we're going to work adjectives, we're going to work adverbs. Something as simple as, okay, let's find the adjectives in this uh, short story. Let's find the nouns, right? You can do character analysis, you know, I mean, I'm jumping here back and forth. But basically to show you, depending on which type of, uh, of level you're working with, character analysis is one of my favorite ones. And it can go from basic students to very advanced students. Character analysis can be simple, simple as, what was the color of his eyes? What was her color of hair? What did she wear? How tall was she? To the other end of the spectrum of, why was she so mean to her sister? What was going on? I mean, was she, did she have problems as a child? Did she have traumas? Was she envious? I mean, what, what made that character tick? You know? You can use graphic organizers. You can ask your students to do a plot line. You know? How does the story begin? What are the rising actions? What is the climax? What is the falling action? What is the conclusion? Where do we see the uh, main conflict being introduced? Okay. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or you can have your students do an illustration if they, they're into drawing. Uh, let's create a comic based on this short story that we just read. Let's do a poster. What would be the best poster, I mean, to, if you wanted to sell the short story, if you wanted to put it in a book, how would you illustrate it? 
what, what would be one image that would basically convey the message of what the story you know, says? Again, the options are limitless. Now, let's get to the fun part, what you guys enjoy. Now, and we're going to look at different resources that I found for you. Today, I'm only, I'm only going to show you four or five resources because each one of these things are very, very hefty. I mean, you find a lot of stuff in here. Um, right now, what I'm doing is giving you a chance to write down this address. It's www.bbc.co.uk slash learning English slash teachers slash children's hyphen stories. Now, you know I love the BBC. Uh, I love the resources. For American teachers, might be like, eh, it's, you know, British English. Again, we've spoken about this before. English is English. I mean, it doesn't matter. Okay. So we'll take a moment for you guys to finish jotting this down, okay? You got it? You see the browser, everybody has it? Okay, cool. All right, so let's visit the site. All right, it's loading, you're a second. Okay, that's very slow. Finally. Okay, one of the cool things about uh, these uh, short stories for children on the BBC is that it has a very friendly format, okay? And you have, you know, I mean, lower intermediate level, and this is ideal to work, you know, with, with children that you are beginning to introduce to the whole concept of uh, short stories and whatnot. And the cool thing is that you have your downloads where you have your practice activities that you can download the actual activities and you have the transcript of the story available to you. Okay? So you can create your own activities or maybe, I mean, you want to take advantage or somebody already you know, created the wheel for you. You simply play the story. Kara met the robot at the airport. She was with her parents. They had been on holiday. Now they were flying back home to London. Kara was looking out of the window when she met it. She loved airport windows. There was so much to see. Planes moving, cargo being loaded. Everyone was so busy. Then, out of the corner of her eye, she saw something moving. When she turned, she saw a robot. Right, so we're going to go to watch its base. Again, you can already um, see some things that you can do with this. You can work simple past. You can use past continuous. You can work past continuous and simple past. You can work vocabulary at the airport, right? You can simply ask questions like, why was Kara there? Uh, what did the robot send to say to her? Why was a robot there? And so on and so after. And again, like I said, you have your practice activities that you can download. And uh, normally they come in a PDF format. So you can actually you know, download them and you can play with them. And you know they, they come in a really cool format. Okay, as you can see. So you have some comprehensive questions, right? You can order the letter here to work I mean, a little bit of vocabulary, circle the great word. You can read a match, you can draw a cover, like I said, and you can create illustrations. And then you have your answer key over here. For each one and every single one of the short stories that you find on this webpage, you're going to find the resources as well. But you know, I think it's pretty cool, right? All right. Now that would be BBC Learning English, right? There are other ones that maybe the webpage is not so impressive. And then you say, uh, that looks like a shady page. Actually, no. I mean, this is a page where, for maybe older students, uh, 
maybe you're not so concerned about your illustration format, you want to get a little bit more academic, and you can simply go to eslyes.com slash eslread, okay? Now, the cool thing about this web page is that you find a lot of resources, I mean, a lot, a lot, a lot of short stories, and you can find them by, by topics, uh, you can go to the main page, you go into any one of these, and the cool thing is that not only do they come with the audio, it looked like rain, the sky was gray, it was almost noon, but the sun was... Are you hearing that, or did I forget to share the sound? Okay, good. <laughs> so, no, that's my, not my every week we say. It's hidden by a gray blanket. It was cool. There were no birds flying anywhere. A couple of birds sat on the telephone wire. Bob was standing outside talking to Bill. They both had their hands in their pockets. So, you have a dictionary here, and then you have different activities here. You have vocabulary activities. Right? Sorry. You have close activities, again, related to the short story. New words, you, you have crosswords, you know, based on the story. So maybe for older students, this is a very cool page. Or younger students that are into this kind of stuff. Again, it's all a matter of you, I mean, figuring out what your students like and what they're into. What, what I like to do with these web pages is I like to, um, you know, explore them, download the resources, play with them. I mean, see how much I can do with this thing, okay? Okay. Let's go back to the presentation. All right. Another cool page that I found was Agenda Web. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little time to write this one down. It's agendaweb.org. Now, not only do they have short stories and, and reading resources, if you go to the main page, which is agendaweb.org, or we'll look at it, you know, briefly, uh, you also find, you know, grammar resources, listening resources. Yes, I know this is a webinar about, you know, um, lesson plans around short stories, but, you know, it doesn't hurt to bump into, you know, eclectic some sites where we can, you know, I mean, take advantage and use other different resources, right? right. Everybody got it? Cool. Now, in Agenda Web, you have short stories for beginners, short stories intermediate, and short stories that are advanced, okay? You can simply, again, go to the short stories, you open them, and same format as the last page that I showed you, which I like actually, because you have. You know, Barbara you couldn't take it anymore. Her upstairs neighbor was blasting his stereo again. She had asked him twice already to turn the volume down. The first time she asked, he was surprised. He said he didn't know that she could hear his stereo. And again, same format. Vocabulary, yes, no questions, close, words, you know, clues, crosswords. You can even have dictation activities. Now, as I mentioned before, you can also explore the home page by simply clicking on home, and you're gonna find grammar exercises, vocabulary exercises, verb exercises, listening comprehension, which you have short stories in a listening format, right? Songs, nursery rhymes, uh, phonetic charts, worksheets of grammar, worksheets of verbs, Again, this is a really cool page, not only for reading comprehension. I bumped into this one accidentally uh, because a couple of webinars ago, I showed you, know, you know, grammar resource pages. But while looking for, you know, short stories, I found this one. So I figured it would be worth to, I mean, show you. Hi, uh, James. Yes, go ahead. I'm so sorry to disturb. Uh, could you tell me if you're actually on the website? Are you showing it at the moment? Oh, I didn't. Um, I'm still in the presentation? Uh, according to me, yes. Oh, sorry. Please let me know when this happens. There we go. Perfect. Thank Zoom, you. Zoom has been a, 
a little bit crazy later. I, I have to check in. And it's happened to me twice this week where I actually share the screen and it shows me here that it's sharing the screen and actually I'm just talking to myself basically. I'm talking to you guys without showing you. Okay, so I'll go back. In Agenda Web, as I was showing you, you have these short stories, right, which go from beginner to intermediate to advanced, right? And we were looking at the noisy neighbor, particularly. And I was showing you that... Barbara couldn't take it anymore. Her as, the format, as the one that we saw before. Vocabulary, yes, no questions, closed words, x four answers, square four keys, dictation, or not. Okay? And I also showed you that you simply click over here when it says home. Okay? And obviously, it's an easier address to find is agendaweb.org. And you, have, you find all of these different activities over there. Okay? All right. Thanks for that, by the way. Let me know if something like that happens, please. Okay? All right. Let's get back to the presentation then. Okay, now it's working. Okay, cool. All right. So we're back on the presentation, correct? All right, ESL bits is a particularly interesting one because if you want to go to the next level, this is something that Melanie would love, for example, because I know she's a literature buff. Um, it's a web page where you can find a little bit more challenging you know, activities. Uh, you can find you know, all sorts of stories. And it's called esl-bits.net, okay? This one is in particular is pretty cool because you have Audiobooks, classics, yes. You have, you know, contemporary audiobooks, you have novellas. And of course, we have short stories, which is the topic for today. And you have advanced and intermediate types of readings, you know, um, articles and whatnot. And this particular page is really cool because of the choice of genres that you have to work with. Okay. Let's take a look at it. Okay, here we are. I'm going to tap into short stories, but you're welcome to, I mean, explore this thing. I was uh, having a blast this week, going through this web page and looking for my classic favorites. Um, I, I love reading. Uh, I do have an extensive library. And I do love, you know, paper, paper bags and the smell of paper. And, and, and I love to have, you know, paper in my hands. But I'm also making the move towards, you know, I mean, this type of resources where I can tap into basically just an infinite, source or plethora, if you may, a cornucopia of, of, of stories, of uh, classics and stuff like that, okay? So this is what is called The Ghost of a Model T. It's a short story, sort of like a- I'm sorry, we can't see you again. Again? Yeah, wow. sorry. <laughs> this is really annoying. Uh, give me a moment, please. And this is something that has never happened before. Here we go. Thank you. Okay, how about now? Yeah, that's good, thank you. So let me go back, thank you. Keep me posted, please, because this thing is acting up, right? Well, again, uh, we've spoken about this with technology, open communication, you know, with whoever's watching you. Fortunately, you've been in my past webinars and this is the first, so you know this is not me, okay? Again, as I was showing you, we have, you know, listen and read, so you can actually have listenings when you read. You have short stories, novellas, novels, classic novels, and you have all types of resources, okay? When we pass to the next page, I'll ask you first if you're looking at it, right? So we don't have to do this again. So let me go into short stories, and I was talking to you about, there's a whole bunch of, of them here, you know. Your ugly tool, Quitters, the judge's house. Some of these are humorous, some of these are classical, some of these are cool. I mean, you may want to go through them. And of course, my favorite, you know, Ernest Hemingway's here. And, you know, you have the Snows of Kilimanjaro, one of my favorite ones. Um, I, I, I fell in love with Hemingway in this, with his literature, of course. But I, I must confess, I, I did have a man crush on the guy too. I mean, tough guy, adventurer, you know what I mean? Alpha male, uh, more, more like a bromance, I would say. <laughs> Because I wanted to emulate. I mean, I, I, I even tried to have the white hair and the beard, you know, and, and the whole Hemingway thing going on over here. But I'm not that tough. But still, you get my, my drift. So 
The goes to Model T, you know, it's not only a cool short story, but look at the cool thing about this web page. You see this bar up here? So I can put it on 125. He was walking home when he heard the Model T again. It was not a sound that he could well mistake. Or I could put it on 65. And it was not the first time he had heard it running in the distance on the road. Although it puzzled him considerably, for so far as he knew, no one in the country had a Model T. He'd read somewhere in a paper, more than likely, that old cars such as Model Ts were fetching a good price. Although why this should be, he couldn't figure out. With all the smooth, sleek cars that there were today, who in their right mind would want a Model T? We had, we had seen this resource before where uh, it, it was like slow English uh, you know, for listening comprehension. This one is actually cool because you can set the speed to your stored tone. So is that too fast? No, you can make it a little faster. Make it a little faster. Is that too slow? A little faster. Is that too fast, teacher? Go back. So all of the stories in this particular web page have this feature, which I thought was one of the coolest thing ever. I mean, because you can actually play with it. What is basically the negative aspect? I mean, these are short stories, <laughs> but like I said, these are for more advanced students, okay? So as you can see, these things are pretty long and they don't come with exercises. Here you have to figure out your own exercises. So, but personally, when I work literature, I like to create my own exercises, depending on what kind of students I'm working with. So maybe um, I'm working with uh, history buffs. So I'll discuss you know, the aspects that led from the roaring 20s, where everything was you know, fun and games and big, big party, and everybody was you know, buying cars, buying radios, and all this sort of, boom, the Great Depression. Or maybe you know, uh, I have students that are into engineering, so we can discuss you know, why the Model T was so successful after you know, Henry Ford created the A, the B, the C, and finally got to the T with the Dutch Brothers, whatever. Um, or maybe I'm talking with um, my students who are economics majors or their business managers, like my corporate you know, clients. And I will discuss with them, well, you know, the model T came into transition when, you know, Thomas Edison came up with the electric grids. Therefore, you know, Rockefeller could not sell his benzene anymore, which led, you know, to Vanderbilt almost shutting down, you know, his railroad lines. And then, you know, Henry Ford has a problem. He needs a fuel for this, you know, new invention. And then Rockefeller says, wait a second, don't I have that thing called gasoline that everybody else was throwing away when they were creating, you know, benzene and I happened to store it just in case somebody needed it. And then Rockefeller for, you know, basically join in and boom, Rockefeller gets richer and, you know, Henry Ford, you know, can sell his automobiles to the masses. And then, you know, here comes Carnegie and says, well, you know, now that Vanderbilt is not going to buy all that steel that I produce for the railroad lines because Rockefeller is not hire hiring him anymore. What if I create buildings with those things and boom, the skyscraper. So see where literature can take you? So you can go into economic history of the United States. You can go into engineering. You can go into, I mean, cultural values. I mean, and then depending on what your students are into, and of course, you have to tap a little bit, you know, I'm a history buff. Uh, I also studied economics and business management, so I'm also into uh, economic history and stuff like that. Uh, but that's the beauty about, you know, literature. It helps you tap into so many things. And then when you go beyond the text and you start creating all these cool connections, then you really get students who are engaged, depending on what, you know, their particular area of interest might be, okay? All right. So, are we back in the presentation now? Yes? No? Okay. So definitely we have a problem here. I'm gonna have to stop sharing and then just start sharing again. All right, so at this point, I want to go into a little heftier web page. Uh, this is one for all of those that say, oh, James is talking again against BBC and British English. Oh, I want something American. Okay, I got American. I mean, I am here to please, as always. So I got you AmericanLiterature.com for those of you that really want to go, you know, into the American classics. And you, you want to tap, you know, into this, this particular genre. It should be on the page now. Okay, so 
here in American literature, we have an awesome, awesome, awesome selection of different uh, literary works. Again, we have short story collections, and we have short stories for children. But if you're more into a more, you know, into a heftier, you know, literature approach, you have favorite female authors. You even have stories by grade level, which are cool. You can inspire your students. You can follow your students. You have great detective novels. Okay? You have authors index. And oh, I forgot something. I'm sorry. I'm going to go back for one second. Please bear with me. There's something I forgot to show you here with this particular one. Was it this one? The model T? I don't know. Never mind. I'm embarrassing myself now. Okay. So you can go into short stories by grade level, okay? And then you have middle school short stories, middle school short stories, elementary school short stories, fairy tales by age, preschool short stories. So you have pretty much everything that you can possibly imagine right here. Let's go into high school. And then you have, this is what I wanted to show you. Sorry, I got confused with the model T. Um, I love the history of the Civil War. I love the history of the Civil War for some reason uh, because it, it, it shaped our country in so many ways. You know, it changed pretty much the world and, and, and it changed, you know, our perception of so many things, you know, civil rights, uh, equality, equal rights for all humans and whatnot. And of course, you know, Abraham Lincoln is a fascinating character for me. So this particular one on occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. Has anybody read this one? Well, this one is a spoiler alert. This is a spoiler alert, okay? This is a soldier that is about to be hung at uh, Owl Creek Bridge. And as they let him go, he feels the, the rope snap. And he feels his throat burning, you know, he can't breathe. Well, he finds himself in the water. And the enemy soldiers are shooting at him, right? And then he goes underwater, you know, and he goes through all these ordeals. And then, you know, he finally escapes. And when he finally arrives to his home, you know, he has survived. He snaps back into reality and then the, the road breaks his neck and dies. That's the call of that. That's a very cool anticlimax, climatic story. I mean, because you don't see it coming. So, anticlimatic stories are one of my favorite ones. Uh, one of the reasons why I love Hemingway. With Hemingway, you never know what's going to happen at the end. Okay? You think that you know, but you don't. So, these uh, particular resources, they come with study guides, a little bit more form, um, formal, you know, if you're working with advanced students or high school students. You have your character analysis, you have the plot summary, you have the different sections, the genres, the particular themes that you're going to work with the story, the historical context, quotes, okay? You have discussion questions. You have useful links if you want to basically expand on this particular one. You have notes and teacher comments by other teachers, you know. So it's a really, really cool resource in particular. And then, you know, when you go into the story itself, this one does not have an audio, okay? This one is basically strictly, you know, reading. So this is something that you can send to your students, you know, beforehand and then discuss it during the class, which is the way I would do it. Uh, if I'm talking about advanced students, which is what I would use this with, Evidently, I'm not going to waste, you know, I mean, 30 minutes of class time reading this thing with them. I would send them the text, you know, assign it as homework, previous homework in preparation for the class, and then I would read it with them, okay? So, I mean, this is personally one of my favorite resources. Uh, again, I might be deviated from, from TEFL here. Remember that as TEFL teachers, you will deal not only with elementary students, but you might be hired, you know, by an institution, bilingual school somewhere, end up teaching, you know, high school students, and you need to know this stuff, you need to have these tools to work with. So you need to be able to work from the very basic to work, you know, with these levels of uh, English literature. And when you get to this level, this is when, uh, you know, I mean, higher order thinking skills are really going to take off. Because you can tap into so many things. Okay, I'm going to stop myself here because I think that you figure it out right now that I'm very passionate about literature. <laughs> so <laughs> I overextended myself for 10 minutes and we need to um, get back to, I mean, the last section, which is when I answer all your questions. Okay. 
No, we can't hear you, okay? What do we have, Laura? Yeah, there we go. Hi, right. uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear oh, you. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, yeah, Melanie, wants to to okay I'll, I'll, I, I don't have so much questions as a comment, lots of comments, um, but I'll be brief. Um, we'll take it, Laura. Okay, okay um, this la I, I ran into somebody during the week in my meditation group mm -hmm. who wants to practice his English, long story short. And I said, hold on, I can get you resources. And um, so this is perfect. And I just want to say that my, my impression without going further yet, I'll do a little bit of a needs analysis, even though I'm not getting paid and all that. I just figure, well, you know, he's enthusiastic. Let's help him out. Um, I imagine that this last one, American Literature, is going to be just what he needs. Um, he's our age and says he wants to read more and do more exercises. So I, I guess that, um, and I was going to ask you, but I don't have to ask you because you provided it. Um, and I get, I guess everything else is not your main, but I just wanted to thank you for this. Everything else I can do later, other time. Okay, cool. Thank you, Melanie. Okay, Laura. Um, I haven't had an opportunity to teach as yet, and I find this very fascinating, you know, the, the information that you're imparting on us. And um, I was hoping that, I know this is not the right forum for this, but I was hoping maybe somebody in Johannesburg could maybe share with me, um, you know, the online, you know, how they go through this whole process with, with the, the online teaching thing, um, you know, the visual thing, the, the, the interaction on, online, etc. cetera. Okay, Laura, uh, did, you, did you see our webinar on teaching online? Sorry, did I see which webinar? The one on teaching online, where I basically give you the basics for teaching online. No, no. maybe I should do that, huh? Yeah, let me show you how to access it, okay? Simply go to YouTube. Are you seeing my screen? You know? uh, yeah, I can see it. Okay. You simply go to YouTube and you're going to type in Global Chapel. Okay? Okay. Just like it sounds. Yeah. And you click on this logo in here, which is our logo, our Global Chapel. Okay. Yeah. All of these things with, you know, this attractive young lady here and, and a friend okay. of mine was webinars and he said, you know, they, they bumped you out. They got this really, you know, Nice looking girl over there. Well, what are you? I'm like, no, no, that's the webinar introduction. Those are actually my webinars. So people get confused. So I'll make that clarification. So if you look down here, over here, we have all of our webinars. Okay. 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 So the one that you want to look at is the one from a month ago, which is called Teaching Online Free Webinar. And in this webinar, what I particularly do. I do have another question here. I, I, I show you, I mean, all this. Now, this is our second talk. Step by step, here I am through the middle of this pandemic. Okay. Laptops okay. or desktops okay. with a very good integrated camera. Uh, you, you may want to have, you know, an HD webcam. Uh, it is an investment, but it's worthwhile, believe me. Make sure okay. you're professional. Okay. I show you a face to face uh, environment we showed on the board. Here we can simply have it already set, you know, on a, on a wharf. Let me mute myself on the other on the video because I, I can't do it twice. I show you. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, I understand. Um, I can do that. And I don't know if other people have had experience whereby they're finding it difficult to secure um, positions. We have another resource for you for that. I mean, again, that's what I love about these things. You can always ask. There's not a problem when we deviate from the topic. You simply go to our um, our online platform. Yes. Okay. We do have a new web page, by the way. Oh. Uh, just about two weeks ago, <laughs> in case you haven't visited our web page. And there is a complete list of teaching of companies that are hiring. Okay. Let me just show you where to go. 
Are you sure it says double jobs over here on this tab? Yes. Go to teaching online, English online list. Okay. And here you have all of the companies that are hiring right now. How often do they update that? Uh, we updated this list about two weeks ago. And we, we actually check every single link making sure that there are no broken links and thank you exactly we have a jobs department we have a jobs coordinator and one of the persons on her staff is charged exclusively with following up on this thing and updating the information so again uh depending okay. on your preference we have american companies we have british companies russian companies spanish companies uh, European companies. <laughs> And we put the link, but we also show you, I mean, a brief description of what you can expect, what the requirements are, what you need to have in order to apply to these companies. And when you click on the link, it takes you to, to the site where you can actually apply for the job. Okay. Okay. You can also contact our jobs department for assistance. Okay. By simply just, you know, I mean, writing to us at jobs at just like my, my you know, jobs at globaltemple.uk.com. Or okay. write to me directly and I'll see what I can help you with and guide you in the right direction. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Laura. That's what we're here for. Okay. Who wants to go next? We have Melanie already spoke, Laura. Uh, Marianne, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I want to yeah. say thank you for that. Um that information too that's answer, that has answered all the questions that i had and i really appreciate the webinar for today very very informative i was waiting for you to write me this week marianne i did not i did last week did you you didn't get it no i did not receive your email just to let you know um, yeah i did send an email after the class last week i didn't hear from you i was about to, to fuss at you but now that you've told me i go back and check my email <laughs> No, I'm, no I, I'm just joking. But I did, I did communicate with you last week, right after the webinar. I was actually going to go through the recording at the point where you give your your email address. Uh huh. As a matter of fact, I haven't had a chance to speak to you, um, and, and because I know I jotted it down somewhere, but you know, mm -hmm. a clean desk is the first sign of a sick mind. Remember that. So yeah, my, but but I did send you an email right after that. I hadn't heard from you either. So hey. Right, could you please resend it to me and? Sure. Uh, I sure will. I think I know what happened. Uh, since we were updating the platform, mm -hmm. we had a lot of issues with the emails. Okay, mm -hmm. and last week, last weekend, is when we did the final change. If, if you if you go into our web page, you know, you'll notice that it looks a lot different mm -hmm. because we changed the platform. And of course, all of our email addresses, you know, and, and servers are tied into that platform. So it's possible that your email never reached me, which is. Okay. I'm pretty sure because I check my email every day and I've been very attentive. I mean, I did not forget about you. Mm -hmm. that is that I just saw you and I was like, hey, what happened? So yeah. I'll check again. If not, what I'll do, if for some reason I don't get your, your email, I'll check the recording of last webinar because I have your, get your email address now. Mm -hmm. I'll just email you the, the PowerPoint on Monday. Okay? Thank you. I appreciate it. Much appreciated. Okay. Okay. I got that bullet. Okay. <laughs> I'm joking, Marianne. All right. Who else wants to ask, question, comment? We're kind of quiet today. I have a question about I have a question about text analysis with an old with older kids. Yeah. Um it was a real shock to me. Uh or some years ago when I realized that people had different analyses of the same text that I did. Um, you know, not so clear cut. So it would seem to me, and I'm really asking for your take on this. So say some kid thinks, well, no, that's not why I think she did so-and-so. It seems to me that the only way to handle that is to have people support their arguments. Yeah, of course. I mean, there's a different point of view for everything, there's a different interpretation. Uh, I'll give you a good example, the Bible. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, so uh, when you're going into 
analysis of situations, uh, maybe motivations as to why this happens. There are so many possibilities, but it's not a matter of who's right or who's wrong. And you, you, no. you hit the nail right on the head, no, by the way, you hit it right on the head. My priority is not whether they say she did it because of this, or she did it because of that, but it's how they argument that position that they take. And that's what you want to focus on. And you may have a whole different take on it and a whole different reading. And many a times, you know, students will show you possibilities or views that you will not have, you know, explored otherwise. And then you, you go like, hmm. Right. No? So actually, yeah, that's uh, with, with text analysis, it's always about, I'll be right with you, Chrissy. With text analysis, I'll be, a, it's all about the argumentation of the generation. As English people, wants to generate communication to convey ideas, and in this case, you know, to tap into higher order thinking skills, analysis, you know, evaluation, of course, creation. Right now, go, Chris, Chrissy, sorry. You need to unmute. Yourself. Thank you. Can you hear me now? <laughs> sorry, no, Chris is fine. That's no problem. Um, it was just a follow on from what Melanie was speaking about, about um, different people having different interpretations. And um, one exercise I've used with the little ones is, you can Google it, it's called Edward de Bono's Thinking Hats. Are you familiar with it? I read some of You can actually take coloured hats into the classroom. They love trying on the hats. But basically, depending on what coloured hat you have on, you give an analysis of a different analysis of the problem. So the black hat, you're very critical, you purely state facts. The red hat is about feelings, you say what you felt about the thing, things like that. The green hat is for growth, you say how you're going to move on from that situation. And you can have any number of problems um, depending on what level of students you are working with. So the last time I did this, my students were maybe in the sort of 17, 18 year group. And the problem I gave them was uh, something like, Peter stole a jacket off of somebody and gave it to Nadia. Nadia didn't know the jacket was stolen and she came to school with it on the next day. So they have to consider this problem from different angles and different viewpoints and it's quite a nice exercise to get them to sort of think about things rather than just reading and repeating back what they've seen and what they've done so you can google it edward de bono's six thinking hats and go around charity shops and collect different colored hats because they really love it and that was just what i wanted to add that's great now that you mentioned it okay. i did attend a seminar about four years ago on the subject and what the guy used was baseball caps. So that, that, that's a good way to, uh, to, to, I mean, not having to go out to a hand shop, find you know, different colored hats, which nowadays might be difficult. You can, I guess, replace them with simple baseball caps. Well, yeah, actually, the same. Said webinar, that seminar was super cool. And get them to make their own hats, take in some paper and crayons, mm -hmm. and they can make and color their own hats. I think so. It's so I guess, or creative. James right. and Stephanie speaking. It's funny, the same thing that I use for business consulting to um, try and create um, business groups to be interactive is with the different hats and different positions where you're sitting in. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Actually, see, that's cool. We start tapping into different things over here. And it is worth reading and going into it, especially when you have a testimony here that it works. One thing is for you to the theory and another thing is to have uh, teachers like Stephanie and teachers like Chrissy you know tell them say this thing works you know try it I'm actually curious myself now and I think I'm gonna give it a try I'll be honest with you I've familiar with theory I, I attended a workshop in one of them. the thing is that I go to a lot of TESOL you know conventions uh, every single year this year obviously not and <clears throat> you know I mean I present and then I, I watch all the presentations with so much information you know, to, to gather in. Uh, you rarely get to apply all of it, but I will. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you, Stephanie. It's a very good suggestion. All right, who would like to continue? We still have a couple of minutes here. Karen, quiet again today? 
Okay, I'm not going to pick on you. All right, not a problem. All right. Uh, so I, I have a question. Um, yeah, one the, um, are you going to have a webinar or could you please devote part of a webinar to dealing with music and song and poetry? Because I was just thinking that the um, properties of poetry um, are less intimidating if they're seen as song first, probably to many, many people. And um, I was, uh, what you were saying about what is, uh, how shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Um, it's lovely for me. It might not be lovely for somebody else. <laughs> um, so I was thinking about ways around that for the people for whom poetry is death because for a lot of people it is. I mentioned poetry and they freeze, they glaze, their eyes glaze. So I'm wondering if you would do something like that. Well, language comes in, in two formats, prose and verse. Simple as that. Prose is basically what we're doing right now is straightforward communication and then you have verse. And verse uh, is used both in songs and poetry. So that's the way that- what? It's what? Spoken songs and poetry. Right. Right, right, right. As I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I take a look at my life. I realize there's nothing left because I've been banging and blasting so long that you remember the things that my life is gone. So whatever. Um, rap, for example, is good. Classic songs are good because they share the same elements. Uh, rhythm, they have, you know, intonation. They have, I mean, all of the elements that you find in poetry, you will find in songs. Yes. Similar, you know, metaphor, you will find, you know, irony, you will find, you know, I mean, the different temples. So, yeah, that is a good idea to introduce uh, students into poetry. Again, depending on the age students that you have. I forget, did you do some, you, you already did something on listening, right? Yes, but not on music and poetry, so we could do a webinar on that. Uh, um, because I have a great exercise for listening, speaking, for drawing on what you know. Um, and I would love to share it here, but we could, you know, be here forever. Um, and I, and I, I'm wondering also the suggestions that people are making here today Maybe we, I don't know if everybody else, how you, how Global TFL would, would appreciate it. just a sharing session, not a, a sharing session online. Okay, not a webinar such, but basically just everybody come in and share different concepts. Okay, I'll discuss it with the board. Or maybe I can set it up, you know, I mean, some other way, but don't worry, I'll, I'll look into it now, okay? Yeah. Thank you. Aware in the craziness of my desk, I can show you, you know, the embarrassing show. Um, I, I do write everything down. It's just that it's a lot of my play, but that's a pretty cool suggestion. All right. Anybody else? Going once, going <laughs> twice, going, going, gone. Chrissy, that's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank right, you. For the ado. Uh, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you again for coming to see us. Uh, next week, we will probably have our new speaker. Her name is Karen. Um, I'm going to, I, I had a very cool meeting with her last week. <laughs> Younger, you know, fresher, you know, face for these webinars. So we were laughing that she's <laughs> half my age. She's 26 years old, British, but extremely, extremely talented, extremely um, qualified. She has studied China, she has studied Europe, she has more degrees than you can possibly imagine. And she's extremely charismatic and extremely enthusiastic. So in case you don't see my face next week, you will see me on that. But I'm pretty sure that you will enjoy our next webinar. We will be um, sending you via email the, the next topics to come. We have, Cara and I haven't decided yet because we have a lot. But I'm definitely going to look into the songs and poetry because that's different from general listening comprehension. This is two different dimensions. So, okay. Like I said, we're talking about rhythm, rhyme, we're talking about stress, we're talking about intonation, we're talking about, you know what I mean, 
uh, different genres of poetry uh, that are simple genres of poetry like haiku, which are only three lines that you might think, you know, are very simple, but they're extremely complex. I mean, some of these guys work for once on those three little lines. Then you have your know, classic poetry, you know, contemporary poetry. You know? and, and, and poetry is such a cool expression of language and culture and, and of human values and taps into all the, those emotions that we that identify with. So yes, we'll definitely work on that. Yes, Karen. Sorry, um, I just wanted to make a suggestion that maybe um, you guys can think about making a webinar about uh, stress as teachers, you know, working at home and how to manage that. Like when you're a lot of students, a lot of hours and being at home with family and kids and, you know, how to manage the stress and how to, you know, not impart that to the students. I don't know if that can be done. <laughs> you guys have a, a, psych, a psychiatrist. <laughs> It's a very, it's a very relevant webinar. I could do one of those myself. Uh, I think I have a PhD on stress management. Uh, I have a wife that is going through, you know, a post-birth syndrome, a depression. I have a kid that is in his terrible tree. He's going into the horrible force. I mean, this guy can pretty much destroy everything. I have a nine-year-old baby that basically demands my attention, you know, 24-7. So believe me, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. And then how do you do to basically sit here and have a big smile and you know, I mean, well, I wanna give you a little heads up of, and I will do a webinar on that. My secret is that this is my therapy. This is not work. I enjoy this profusely. That, that's why it's so hard for me to say goodbye, you know, every single Saturday. I, I look forward to this like a kid going to this like that. Because this is when I connect with you on more passion, I connect with you guys, and I disconnect. I love my family, don't get me wrong. But I have a chance to escape you know, a little bit from all the craziness at home. And, but I will definitely do a webinar on that, uh, Karen. Thank you for that idea, that's fantastic, because that's very relevant to, to the subject matter of these webinars, which is teaching online. We haven't tapped, we've been going into, too much into the academic part, and we're forgetting about the human aspect of being a teacher. So, awesome. Marianne. I just wanted to say hi to Teresita. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, that being said, guys uh, and girls, and ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful weekend. Ackman was very quiet today. I'm, I'm surprised I didn't hear him speak. <laughs> that was also quiet today, but I guess we have our days. All right, so stay safe, as I always say. Yeah and Godspeed, and I will see you next webinar or the one after. Don't worry, I'm not going away forever. I will come back. Thanks. Uh, I think Thanks. Kevin's here too. Bye, right, Kevin. Take care. I'll email you, Miriam. Okay. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so you much, Jay. Bye. 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 You guys take care and I'll see you soon. Okay, okay. Bye, David. I haven't seen you there. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs>